Assalamualaikum 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 Good evening everybody We are transmitting here live from Amman Jordan from Farah Medical Campus My name is Ibrahim Sabah, I'm a neurosurgeon And the backdrop is a view from Wadi Ram in Jordan Wadi Ram is near Petra and uh, which is one of the World uh, Seven Wonders and uh, many films have been filmed there including Lawrence of Arabia uh, the topic for tonight is extremely interesting and I hope that we will uh, agree to disagree in this meeting because it's not nice to listen to different opinions. What do we have? We have induced osteomalacia, the so-called oncogenic osteomalacia. This is due to spinal tumor. We will discuss the clinical, radiological, operative and pathological correlation. Osteomalacia has so many causes, you know. Vitamin D deficiency, renal diseases, drugs, toxins, inherited disorders, and one of the causes of osteomalacia is, brain, is uh, tumors, or spinal tumors. So this is the topic for tonight. Tumor-induced osteomalacia, TIO, or in abbreviation, oncogenic osteomalacia. So what is oncogenic osteomalacia? It's a condition in which a tumor, whatever that may be in the bone or soft tissue, that would secrete hormones called phosphatonines, including fibrous growth factor 23, that would lead to renal phosphate wasting. So kidneys will waste the phosphate, so we'll get hyperphosphaturia and hypophosphatemia, and that would lead to adult osteomalacia or children rickets. And people think that rickets no more exist, it's still existing like TB, like others. So if you develop chronic hypophosphatemia and you're an adult, you'll have bone pains and you'll get fractures because of osteomalacia. Your teeth will start dropping, you'll feel generally weak, myasthenia. You cannot move, you cannot walk, you cannot turn. So your stature will go uh, smaller and you will lose height. And children, of course, it is rickets, growth stunting, inability to ambulate, the skeletal deformity. So this disease, there's no age group is immune to this, and it is peak in the adults, males equal to female, but children are also affected. Which tumors cause this? Any tumor? Many tumors. Uh, the topping of the list is missing caramel tumors, Chondroblastoma, chondrosarcoma, hemangioma, hemangiendothelioma, giant cell tumor, hemangiopericytoma, fibrous ossifying or non ossifying fibroma, fibrous dysplasia, solitary fibrous tumors, multiple myeloma, and various carcinomas. So many causes for this. But the one that topped the list is missing kind of tumor. For this, I'm going to ask Dr. Ahmed Juma to give you a brief about the disease. Thank you. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Tumor-induced uh, osteomalacia TO, it is characterized by severe hypophosphatemia and osteomalacia with renal phosphate wasting that occurs in association with the tumor. TO is also called oncogenic hypophosphatemic osteomalacia. There is some code for this M83.3 and appears in the portal for rare disease and orphan disease under the name. This is a code name. It was discovered uh, first case by uh, Robert McKins in 1947, who reported patients with pain. Uh, weakness, gait abnormalities, and low phosphorus level. The patient was treated with high dose vitamin D, but the symptoms did not complete the result until a tumor in the femur bone was removed. The first person to clearly recognize that the disease was the result of racketogenic substance was Andrea Prader. In five, uh, 1959, he described uh, uh, 11 years old girl who developed severe rickets over the course of one year, and the evaluation showed decreased tubular phosphorus absorption, but otherwise normal kidney function. Uh, a tumor classified as Jan cell granuloma was identified in the rib and removed, resulting in healing of rickets. 
epidemiology around 500 cases uh, till last year was reported in the literature, literature. It is a little bit rare disease. It is not common disease. All over the world reported only around 500 cases. And a lot of them, they are sporadic. Uh, there is no large series except one from Japan, which we'll talk about. Uh, pathogenesis, the first evidence of circulating factor that could be cause phosphate the wasting in phosphate disorder, such as EO was demonstrated in a set of experiments in mice by Mayer. The first evidence to support this concept in humans was the experiment by, uh, from Japan tell by Miyawachi, in which the tumor removed from a patient and transplanted into nude mice caused hypophosphatemia. Uh, FGF23 was first identified as phosphatiuric substance when mutation and FGF23 were linked to autosomal dominant type of phosphatemic crickets. Soon after that, elevation of serum and serum FGF23 were found in TO, and it was shown that FGF23 binds to target proximal tubule cells via FGF receptors and obligate core receptors clodo inhibit renal phosphorus reabsorption in the proximal renal tubules. The primary transport protein responsible for phosphate uh, reabsorption, it is uh, called type 2 sodium phosphate co-transporter, and the inhibition of these co-transporters cause uh, increased renal wasting and hypophosphatemia. In addition, FGF23, it caused inhibition of the conversion of 25 hydroxyvitamin D into active metabolite, which is 125 hydroxyvitamin D. Therefore, with the very low serum level of 125 hydroxyvitamin D, you can expect there is a decrease in intestinal absorption of uh, phosphorus and calcium, which leading further exacerbation of hypophosphatemia and sometimes hypocalcemia, which could lead to secondary hyperparathyroidism and with those long-standing disease, if not treated, it could even end with tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, age and then the gender and location of tumors. Uh, there is, was a large review by Jiang from Japan 308 tumor induced osteolacia in English literature was reviewed between 1987 and 2011. About 46 of reported cases in females and 56 in males. The average age it was 45, and the tumors 40% originate from bones and the soft tissue around 55%. The localization of tumor, uh, usually uh, thigh and femur, 22%, craniofacial, 20%, ankle, foot, around 9%, pelvis, 8%, fibula, tibia, around 6.5%, arm, 6.5%. Less common localization are uh, vertebrae, knee, hand, chest, abdomen, groin, perineum. Sometimes uh, the tumor could be multiple, around 2% of cases reported in different sites. Sometimes it can, even localization could be in liver, tongue, thyroid, lungs. Natural course of disease, patients with you usually often present with many years of symptoms before they are diagnosed. The average time between onset of symptoms and diagnosis, it is around five years with range from one year to 20 years. The symptoms usually are non-specific and often progressive. Common complaints are bone pain, muscle weakness, reduced height, multiple fractures, primarily in the ribs, vertebral bodies, and femoral neck. The patients are often misdiagnosed with a variety of musculoskeletal, rheumatological disease, and sometimes a psychiatric illness. Lab findings, in this case, persistent, very low phosphorus low renal tubular, uh, uh, lower tubular reabsorption of phosphorus, normally around 85, 8 to 95 percent, 
of phosphorus excreted via the uh, kidney to the urine, usually it is reabsorbed again in the circulation. But in uh, the majority of patients, there are inhibition of reabsorption and a lot of uh, phosphorus leak in the urine. Therefore, indirectly, we can measure that by 24 hour urine phosphorus, which is very high. And uh, usually 125 hydroxy vitamin D, usually it is very low or inappropriately normal. There is a high alkaline phosphatase and the most important, there is a high level of FGN, uh, FGF23. It is reported to be normal in very rare cases, which is again inappropriate. 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D usually low, but it is not diagnostic. Serum calcium usually low or on the lower limit uh, of normal. PTH is usually high. Kidney function is normal. This is the common causes, other causes of hypophosphatemia. Uh, we must remember that poor intestinal uptake of phosphorus caused by vitamin D deficiency or intestinal phosphate binders or niacin could cause hypophosphatemia. Uh, Increased sequestration in cell by insulin or proliferative malignant conditions such as leukemia could cause hypophosphatemia or sequestration in bone matrix by, by, by phosphin, which is used for osteoporosis. Renal causes uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. It is a common cause of hypophosphatemia. FGF-dependent causes, which we, Dr. Ibrahim just mentioned, and PTH independent, FGF3 independent causes like alcoholism, drug or toxin, renal tubular acidosis, Fanconi syndrome, etc. This is the largest series from Japan. It is, uh, they reviewed their own series. It is 144 patients. This is the clinical manifestation, the most common bone pain, difficulty in walking, pathological fracture, height loss, muscle weakness, thoracic deformity, spinal deformity, tooth uh, loss or bone uh, or loose tooth, local lump. The misdiagnosis uh, uh, condition in patients with uh, tumor-induced uh, osteomalacia, they are a lot uh, disc, spondyloarthritis, osteoporosis, uh, femoral head necrosis, hyperparathyroidism, rheumatoid arthritis, bone metastasis, connective, tissue disease, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia. This is the uh, FGF-related hypophosphatemic disorders. We see here uh, 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 X-linked uh, hypophosphatemia rickets, uh, autosomal uh, dominant. Uh, another autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic uh, FGF-23 uh, mutations. This, uh, it is very helpful sometimes uh, for uh, gene expression or uh, gene workup uh, can help you sometimes for uh, differential diagnosis of different type of records. Also, FGF1, it is uh, high in patients with mccune albright syndrome, polyostatic, polyostatic uh, fibrous dysplasia, and it is also in hypophosphatemic disease with <laughs> dental anomalies and ectopic calcifications, tumor-induced osteomalacia. This is our talk here. It is very high. This is, again, review from uh, 144 cases. This is the approach for patients with hypophosphatemia. Uh, reality causes uh, usually X-linked hypophosphatemia with or uh, uh, autosomal dominant Hypophosphatemia, usually it is in children and adolescents. Usually it is not an old age. There is a positive family history. There is a cranial deformity, suggestive of rickets, bowing day of legs, widening of rest, growth retardation, dental problems. And there is a typical uh, X-ray uh, characteristics of rickets. And of course, you can do gene mutation for such condition. mcconnell bright syndrome, usually it is also, you can exclude clinically by fibrous dysplasia, caffeine pus, precocious puberty, and other things. Uh, Fanconi syndrome here, it is, uh, whether it is idiopathic or secondary to other causes, uh, but it is usually associated with other abnormalities like uh, acidosis, hypokalemia, 
uh, hyperosemia and glucosuria, proteinuria, aminoaciduria. It is easy to diagnose whether it is idiopathic or related to other like Jugrain syndrome or malignancy, multiple myeloma, gamma, glob uh, gamma, pathy, gamma globulin pathy, or plasma cell disorders. Yeah, I mean, a lot of conditions can Jugrain syndrome, Wilson disease, uh, cystinosis, a lot of uh, other entities can cause Fanconi syndrome. Also, it is not uh, difficult to exclude neurofibromatosis. Uh, after excluding all causes of hypophosphatemia, usually you proceed for imaging. The best imaging technique for identifying the tumor, because the tumors usually they are very small and different to, uh, very difficult to uh, localize, the best way is to do dotatate scan, uh, and then if you localize by dotatate scan, PET scan, you proceed for anatomical imaging like CT or MRI. If it is single lesion, you can go ahead for surgical excision and cure. If it is multiple lesion, you can go for various sampling for FGF23. Unfortunately, in Jordan, I asked uh, doctor, uh, you remember our case, I asked you whether you are doing uh, FGN, FGF23. Nobody doing FGF23. Uh, and even in Jordan University and the Coin Hussein Medical Center, they send the sample outside to my clinic for doing, and it cost around 450 GD just to do FGF23, uh, FGF, uh, and it uh, needs around two weeks to obtain the results. I will uh, let uh, Dr. later, Dr. Mais Halasi, talk about the imaging techniques for such tumor. Uh, this technique, uh, it is not, uh, because the cases are uh, very rare and sporadic and few cases are reported in literature, now there is a one trial going on in my clinic to, to, for detection of such tumors by this uh, dotated PET uh, CT scan. Uh, I think uh, surgery, if it is done and the tumor is removed completely, usually the patients, they are cured, and there is norma normalization of serum phosphorus. Within even one week, there is normalization of phosphorus and normalization of GF23. This is phosphorus level. This is before surgery cut point here, and phosphorus is going up. Within two weeks, it reached uh, the normal range. This is alkaline phosphatase dropping down within a few weeks. And the same applied for FGF23. It is very high here, and it dropped immediately within days to the normal range within five, six days, if the tumor removed completely. The tumors could be, as we mentioned, localized in, uh, from the foot until the head. A lot of localization of the tumor, therefore, and the tumors usually very small, you have to do the best way it is due to the scan. One case even reported here in the uh, forearm. Here in spine, one case reported. Uh, here in spine, like our case, which we will review. Thank you. I'll let uh, later on we'll talk. Dr. Mais, if you want to talk about Okay, sure. Okay. So, Dr. Mais, can you go to the case in question? I mean, there's a lot of talk about looking for an occult tumor in the case of tumor induced assimilation, limb assimilation. But in the case in question, the tumor was a parent. So, the, whether the patient had a perineoplastic process going on at the same time is interesting. But the tumor itself was a parent. It's not like we were fishing the water and origin. The patient. Uh, history just for this patient, our patient. The patient traveled to Jordan during the past five years, four times a year, to treat his hair proximal muscle weakness and severe pain and kyphosis, and nobody detected. Oh, okay. And she traveled to Germany. The patient traveled to Germany, the patient traveled to England, and nobody detected the tumor. This is... Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. So for the benefit of uh, those uh, who came late, we're discussing uh, oncogenic osteomalacia, osteomalacia caused by a tumor. Uh, 
Uh, another thing, the patient came to Dr. Ibrahim because there was a neurological deficit now. The tumor causing compression on the spinal cord, this is the clue for diagnosis. Correct. Okay. So no. you're assuming that the neurological examination was performed properly or at all in the previous session. Who will discuss the that? No, there was no previous. previous. Previously, there was no neurological exactly. deficit. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to mention that. So well. Exactly. Exactly. They are in rush. They want to reach the bottom of it before. So we are discussing an oncogenic osteomalacia caused by these kind of tumors that are difficult to locate and difficult to diagnose. Uh, 300, 400 cases reported in literature. Locations. Look at this rickety. A uh, young man with this tumor here. These are papers that has been published. It could be the cranium like this. Lots of pediatric cases because they present with rickets or they present even with tumors without any signs of rickets. Another case of pediatric with this tumor, the foramen magnum can present to the tumor in the axilla. Who would look in the axilla of a man to look for a tumor there? Very few. In the hands, in the thigh, in the pelvis, in the heart, in the chest, in the foot. Who would examine feet of patients these days? Very few. And of course, because our case is a spinal case, it can go also into the spine. I looked up this very beautiful paper, published January 2019, very recent, just a couple of weeks ago, in from China, and they reported 17 cases of spinal tumors, of phosphaturic mesenchymal tumor, and they added one case of theirs, so there are 18 cases. And here we add one, so there are 19 cases of spinal tumors causing osteomalacia. And there they are, and the, the area and the, the name of the author, the year, etc., etc. And most of the cases come cervical, then thoracic, then lumbar, then sacral. So most of the time, it is in this area. Can we go back to the previous slide? For sure. sure. I'm actually looking at the, the subtype, the classification of every mesenchymal tumor. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, it can affect the cervical spine, as you can see, and whereby you can need to do this kind of accession and fixation. Usually, the tumor cannot be removed completely, most of the time. Very rarely, you can remove it completely. It's in the spine. If it is in the spine. In the spine the Absolutely. Spine, the tissue, Absolutely. The in the cranium, in the cranium, just the same. If you have a tumor, the skull base, sometimes it's difficult to access completely. And again, this was in, uh, published by the Japan Orthopedic Association 2014. You can see the block accession, the vertebrectomy, and the fusion there is. Another case in the cervical spine with fixation. Uh, this is from the Korean Neurosurgery Journal 2011. Another case in the scored dumbbell tumor. So, tumor in the spinal canal going outside, dumbbell tumor. And another case uh, from Japanese Orthopedic Association 2012, this kind of a tumor. Another pediatric case from the Association of Bone and Joint. You can see the tumor there and the need for surgical excision and stabilization and fixation. They're quite invasive. They are, absolutely, they are. Because it is late to diagnose them, that's the, that's the reason. So what's the treatment? Surgical excision, and the aim is to totally excise if you can. In cases of the spine and skull base, usually it's difficult. You can give medical treatment for the osteomalacia, phosphorus, and castrol. You can give radiation, you can give chemotherapy, and recently, they are treating with somatostatin analogs and radionuclear therapy and anti 
fibrous growth factor 23 antibody. These are the latest uh, lines of treatment. Surgical treatment, uh, you are dealing with aggressive tumors, so you have to be aggressive like this. And you do in block excision vertebrectomy uh, in these cases. So the red tissue had 18 cases about surgical excision, and there were three recurrences. So recurrences are rather high. And this is one of them. This is the tumor, calcified tumor in the lumbar area, excised fixation, and then recurrence five months later. So they are bad. Another case also, 2017 from Poland, that's the tumor, they excised it, and then they have recurrence after one year, they took it out again, it came back again three years later. So it is high recurrence rate, that's the message. Can there be the malignant? Yes. Of the 18 cases that have been reported in the literature, 15 were benign, three were malignant, and one was with metastasis. And uh, this is the patient. I, I actually ask how many residents would examine the feet of patients, or between the toes, or under the nails, and so on. So this was the case of metastasis to the chest. So we'll come to the, uh, our case, uh, spinal tumor. This lady, 60 year old from Libya, and she came to us in March 2018. But her condition started 2012 when she was in Libya. She had weakness in her lower limbs and she started to bend forward with, with short stature. So she traveled to Germany, to Dusseldorf. There she was treated for four years and she was given treatment for osteoporosis without any improvement. She was progressive. They have done their investigations, but they found nothing. So this is the hospital she was treated in. And this is the diagnosis, osteoporosis. Fine, osteoporosis, treatment, no improvement. So she went also to England. And uh, early in 2018, she went to Tunisia. She at that time was wheelchair bound. She could not walk at all. She was in severe pain and she required morphine for her pains. I must say that I admire the diligence of the Tunisian doctors because they went very deep into trying to find the, the cause of this. Brain MRI was normal. But let's look at this curve, double curve, convex to the right, and look at this, crumbled vertebrae with fractures. They have done the, uh, uh, the scan for the bone and they found she had osteopenia, of course. They knew that. And also she had PET scan because they said, well, we did not see any obvious lesion. Uh, so let's do PET scan. They did PET scan and PET scan was negative. Does that answer you, Anna? They tried their best, but they couldn't. Yes. So that's the PET scan. They found the hot spots, but they just stopped it there. Again, the technician scan. Uh, hematology that they have done was normal. Bilirubin uh, total and uh, total and direct and indirect and elevated alkaline phosphatase. That's one of the main uh, findings in this uh, hypophosphatemia, hypophosphaturia. Alkaline phosphatase was raised. Uh, this is the. Yeah, it's not. Uh, creatinine was a little bit high with, with chloride. Uh, Parathyroid. Can I, uh, because she was on treatment all yeah, the time. Yeah, exactly. She was on very small doses of one alpha Fair and phosphate and Fair very small doses, therefore I can understand. Yeah, because one of the treatments you were saying was uh, yes. treatment of phosphate. Phosphorus and cholesterol. Yeah. Yes. Parathyroid was within normal. It could be abated. Thyroid functions were normal. That's all in Tunisia. Parathyroid also. Again, it was not significant, but vitamin D was low at one stage. Uh, phosphate and the blood was low, and alkaline phosphatase was high. Calcium was other limit of normal. Uh, hepatitis, uh, all were negative. Urine analysis, negative. And they have done EMG because she had weakness. She could not walk. So maybe she has peripheral neuropathy. No peripheral neuropathy, no radiculopathy, maybe myopathy. 
that's how, how, how poor these patients are. They're looking for a solution. That's the EMG, nerve conduction studies. They even went to muscle biopsy. Usually they take muscle. Uh, um, so why did the lesion show up? I will tell you. <laughs> they are all in a hurry. We will. <laughs> so they have done the muscle biopsy and they could win the thing. Huh? Tunisia. I mean, you do the best Yes, you can even ask. Why did they show up in the country? Yeah, they have the surgeon. Yeah. Cardiac, maybe she is dysnic, maybe she is what? So she had cardiac. Conclusion, normal systolic diastolic functions, left ventricle, mild aortic regurgitation. So this is not a cause for her general weakness. Transthoracic echocardiography. Mild decalcified aortic cups with mild degree, that's it. nothing major. They have done abdominal ultrasound, small gold bladder, stones. A breast ultrasound, maybe she has malignancy, normal. Uh, they even have done pap, pap smear. Maybe she has cervical carcinoma and nobody is detecting it. Pap smear was negative. Papa Nicolau. They even gone for gastroscopy and colonoscopy. Uh, the usual cliche, mild congestive gastritis. I, I have never seen anything else except all people writing this in all patients. And the panorama view. Uh, this is my daughter, Tamara. I see this already here. So um, loss of teeth, as we mentioned. So she came to Jordan at the end of the day. And at that time, she was not at all able to walk. She had numbness in her lower limbs. She even had urine incontinence. She was generally weak and fatigued and with this knee. Uh, as we said, she reached the age of menopause. Short stature height was 1.5 meters. She was higher than this. She was, uh, her kids said that she was 165. Weight was low, calf was scoliosis. She was print forward and she could not walk. Uh, nothing in her cranial nerves, nothing in her upper limbs, but in her lower limbs she had severe weakness. Two over five one side, one over five on the other, upgoing plant response, risk reflexes, and sensory level at T3. Uh, unusual finding was wasting of interest in the right hand, uh, that's because of nerve retrapment. But look at her sitting at the edge of the bed, poor, miserable, uh, lost hope completely for any solution. Uh, CBC and rest were okay. Images. I'm, I'm going to refer to the images in general for the disease and how difficult it is to diagnose it. And then I'll come to the images of this patient. The, the, the major point that it is extremely difficult to find these tumors. They are often too small, they are strange, and they are hidden in strange places. That's the message. Very difficult to find, and they are challenged to find. Uh, you can have plain X-rays, whole body MRI, whole body CT, technetium, indium, octroid uh, scans, PET scan. So you have to try to everything. Plain X-rays can show you stenotic lesions like this. Uh, a technetium scan will show you increased uptake in the ribs, for example. And uh, whole body technetium scan, you can see the increased uptake in the neck. Uh, whole body MRI on this side and the FDG PET scan on the other, we can, can find these tumors, especially if they are small. Another case of uh, MRI, and then you can find this region in the L5. That's why FDG PET -set scan. Again here, that's the lesion. Sometimes you may miss that on the plain X-rays, CT, MRI, but the PET CT uh, can show you that. Various examples of this. Even in the cranium, you can find it. Here in the vertebra, you can see it by the PET. Again, PET CT can give you the clue. Various examples, just to show you the importance of these uh, things that uh, digging deep into the patient is the solution. Here it is in the shoulder. Uh, Octreo scan, 
this the region here it's there again after a scan can show you these difficult tumors now let's look at the images of our patient when she arrived to Jordan. Plain X-ray, you can see osteoarthrosis here between the transverse process of L5 and the, and the sacrum. And then you can have this uh, trilogate uh, pelvis and she had osteolytic lesion here in the symphysis pubis and some osteoarthritic changes in her hips. Look at this, horrible curve, double curve, uh, convex to the right, uh, and here you can see the destruction. But look at what is left in her chest, and we'll ask later Dr. Adzelman to comment on that. Look at the curve, what is left of the lungs. Here the MRI, cervical, you see a good code, and then here, the level of D4, you start seeing something. You go down, you can see the code, and then there is a mass, mass here, here, and here, and here. So that's why we say you cannot remove them completely. Go further, this is the code, it's squashed, completely squashed, posteriorly and anteriorly. That's the code. And this is the uh, transverse cuts. You can see the tumor in the body here in the canal and the lamina, etc. You think it's the tumor that is impinging on the, the core? Will that because of the osteomalacia? No, no. It is the tumor. We will show it. So now we we'll go to the down and the thoracic area. The spinal cord is okay, but there are changes here, changes here. So multiple changes. How come it didn't show up in a PET scan? The, their PET scan was not successful for, for <laughs> one reason or the other. I mean, that what? Was an oh, yeah. As I said, when she came to us, she had definite neurological conditions. She, she must have had uh, cord compression and we showed on the MRI. But she didn't have MRIs then, right? She there? did have spinal MRIs then. There, yes, and it was. From the and she did, did not show any spinal cord compression. So we asked yeah, Dr. Uh, Raiz Liman, where are you, Raiz? Right? Can you come here, please? Uh, we asked Dr. Raiz Liman, a chest physician, to see this patient because what, what can we do for her if we go for surgery? What about her lung, lung volumes, etc.? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Um, well, this case with regard to my specialty is, is her severe kyphoscoliosis and, of course, the effect of that on the lung dynamics and mechanics. Of course, when you have somebody with, with this uh, uh, severe deformity of the spine, of course, there would be also deformity of the, of the chest wall, okay, rib cage. And this would definitely negatively impact the dynamics of the lung expansion. Now, Long-term uh, kyphoscoliosis like this would result in uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension because of the poor lung expansion results in uh, uh, in what we call hypoxemia that results in uh, vascular bed contraction and then fibrosis. And this would result in further hypoxemia and hypercapnia after that. So it definitely has an impact on the patient's uh, uh, health, but also in the case of her surgery, it will definitely have an impact uh, perioperatively. So uh, I, was, I was consulted to evaluate her, uh, her lung function with regard to her ability to undergo uh, any surgical intervention. To my knowledge, she had a significant restrictive abnormality in her uh, uh, lung volumes, okay? And, but because of the situation, surgery was, was, was uh, urgently needed. So basically, I wouldn't say don't do the surgery, but do the surgery with, with a lot of precautions. Precautions here are during surgery, high oxygen flow, and after extubation, of course, there is an immediate post-op uh, close observation, uh, particularly if the patient fails to extubate right after surgery. She might need to be intubated for 
for several hours, up to one or two days sometimes, till uh, uh, she wakes up from the anesthesia effect and of course from, from the surgery because the surgery will have an impact on pain. So you give some pain medications, pain medications will definitely uh, negatively impact uh, um, uh, breathing. So <clears throat> basically I give the green light with these uh, extra uh, uh, perioperative precautions. Unfortunately, he gave us the green light. <laughs> uh, Ala, you are also consulted to see this patient. Rather wait until. Wait until. Okay, fine. No problem. Yes. Doctor Akan, Najal, Doctor Akan, we consult him as a spinal orthopedic surgeon just in case we need fixation, etc. And anesthesia, uh, Doctor Basil Qada, we ask him to come. He is not. Uh, Doctor Faraz. Well, Aisha, would you comment on what is the anesthesia uh, peculiarities in this case? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, for these interesting cases. Uh, this case in specific actually um, poses a, a great challenge to any anesthetist. And actually, I empathize with the guy, uh, Dr. Basil, who lies there. Uh, the, uh, there are three major issues in this case. Uh, the first one is the kyphoscoliosis. And scoliosis actually, as uh, Dr. Ra'id said and mentioned before, the resective lung disease poses a major challenge, especially interoperatively and postoperatively. Uh, that's one side of the story. The other side is <coughs> that she has hypophosphatemia. And um, as you might all know, uh, phosphorus, um, in the form of phosphate is extremely important, especially in the production of ATP. So that's the major cause of her muscle weakness. And um, so the major issue for us as anesthetists is her proximal myopathy. Um, sometimes they do have cardiomyopathy, especially in children, uh, but this is an adult who is 60 years old. And uh, the other major issue is that they might uh, <coughs> um, uh, they might go into left ventricular dysfunction and diastolic dysfunction, but in this case, her echo, which was done in Tunisia, uh, it was normal. Um, the other major uh, issue uh, for her is her severe osteomalacia, which poses an extreme uh, challenge, especially in terms of positioning during anesthesia. Um, uh, so these are the three main uh, major issues that we have to tackle uh, during her anesthetic. Uh, intraoperatively. In terms of postoperative care, as Dr. Raid mentioned, these, um, if the, the lung volume, especially the forced vital capacity, is extremely decreased uh, because there are uh, several degrees of deformities in these, especially in severe forms of kyphoscoliosis, which cause severe restrictive lung disease. So uh, if her uh, lung function tests um, uh, prove to be uh, less than 50% of her expected uh, Force vital capacity and for, uh, force expiratory volume in, in, in one second, uh, she poses, uh, she has a major uh, risk factors for post operative ventilation, as Dr. Ryan mentions, and they might need post operative ventilation for one or two days. The other major challenge is her post operative pain management. Uh, because pain would cause severe atelectasis. This, is, this in turn would cause um, pneumonia and eventually sepsis and death. So uh, taking care of her pain management is extremely vital in this case. Thank you. So you can see we have uh, mountains of problems to face. We got the consent for the surgery and we were frank about what we are expecting and what uh, she has, etc. And uh, we said that the complication rate is in the range of 30%. And we expect, you know, we just mentioned that in details, means that 30 patients out of 100 patients having the same surgery would have complications. And these complications would include, but not exclusively, infection, bleeding, CSF leak, uh, spinal cord damage. And most importantly, she may not improve after surgery because she spends a long time with cord compression. So let's see the surgery. I apologize for the quality of the film. Uh, uh, we use the Zeiss microscope, but it seems that the colors were not uh, will match. But you will get the clue uh, of the major findings here. Uh, of course, the localization of where to open, 
the patient is in the prone position. Where to open here, I'm finding tissues, and this white is the spinal cord. I'm trying to remove this flesh tissue from the dorsum of the spinal cord. The bone here has been removed, very vascular, extremely vascular. And you can see it's fleshy. They are cutting it with the scissors. It's very vascular. I meant to leave these uh, views for you to see how vascular it is. That's all tumor. Uh, this is tumor. And the white is the spinal cord. I know this is very characteristic. Yes. This tumor to be very vascular. Absolutely. Um, metastasis from thyroid, from colon, are very vascular. And some vascular tumors. Uh, can be that vascular. This was very vascular. Bone, tissues, etc. Here was removing the involved bone from the lamina. Here is the major mass of the tumor. Again, here's the cord, the back of the spinal cord. This is destroyed pedicle. What was your aim when you entered to relieve the compression? Just, my aim is just to relieve the cord compression, give a chance to recover neurologically, and then continue with whatever modalities of treatment we have. As I said, you cannot remove the tumor completely. Again, here uh, we are taking the tumor off the back of the cord and on the uh, left side, as we have seen on the MRI. What was the uh, Timing, I mean, from the onset of the first symptoms ever to the time. So six years. Six years. Full six years. And they say that when they start complaining, it's been there for at least two years. So we're not talking about long time. But what is the time when she was off the Sorry, what was? Before she became off in a wheelchair bound. Yes. Two years. Two years. Yes, two years. Yep. So between the, I forget, Tunisian MRI and post-MRI yes. two years. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. yes, in continence, yes. Because the completion of the code is uh, circumferential. Uh, the joint position sensed by the uh, kinetin gracile in the back, the, uh, the parameter tract in the front, and uh, some nerve uh, entrapment here. Uh, again, I just want to show you that. It is just humans. Sorry? You went to different humans? No, uh, two levels, just two levels. The C4, the thoracic four and thoracic five. Well, there is. Having to give her blood to her? Well, during surgery, yes, we had to. It was very, very bad. Very but look at this. Uh, the bone is very fragile. It's uh, destroyed completely. <laughs> <laughs> My aim is not to turn medical excision. You just can't. It's impossibility to remove the tumor from multiple levels of her spine. My aim is to relieve that cord condition, which we have seen on the MRI at these two levels. Did you do any fixation? No, we did not. If you have one pedicle in the thoracic spine, you don't need to because the ribs will splint your vertebra. So most of the time, you don't need fixation in the thoracic area unless you do total vertebrectomy. Yes. Uh, did she need uh, total vertebrectomy? No, no, there was no need. Total vertebrectomy is a major uh, aggressive uh, invasive procedure that you need to do in a very specific small number of cases. Again, I've left this blood intentionally for you to see how vascular it is. In neurosurgery, we don't allow one drop of blood, but here I just let it go and, and see it. Again, we're removing this band at the back of the cord. The white is the cord, the dura. In fact, when you do that, you know you have done a good job when you see pulsations in the cord. This is the only definite sign that you have done 
a good decompression of the cord, start pulsating. Before that, it was not. The damage to the cord is ischemic in nature by the compression. So once they start pulsating, it means they have done a good job. At the time of surgery, you knew what the kind of tumor it was? No. No. no I had no idea. You just give up. Yes, and here is the... Uh, such a placenta we got the environment. Yes, but I guess, again, again, we have to wait for the permanent uh, sections. But my job has been done, meaning that uh, I aim to decompress the cord. I've achieved that, and I'm waiting for the next step. <clears throat> First up, she improved dramatically. That's third day, post up. With the physiotherapist holding her hand, she could take a few steps. She was still in hospital. She came for a visit in the clinic. She could walk alone. And further visit, she could walk alone. So a definite improvement by surgery. Now, let's see. Yes, during surgery, during and after. Yes, we had to, of course. Uh, I, um, I have to tell you that there are some discrepancies in the uh, histopathologic report. And I, I expect that we understand the, 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 the aim of this discussion is to enrich our discussion and reach to the uh, good uh, uh, diagnosis. So the first uh, report by Dr. Rob Farsakh, please. Uh, this case was sent for uh, frozen section, so we called it mesenchymal sarcoma. Wait for the uh, exact definition later on permanent. But you can see uh, this tumor has really characteristic pattern and there are small cells and adjacent uh, high, uh, very hypocellular areas adjacent to hypocellular areas and in hypocellular areas you, you see the cells looks like chondroid in origin uh, this interposition of uh, very high cellular areas with hypocellular chondroid areas usually typical of uh, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma uh, you can see here this is the hypercellular areas the cells are hyperchromatic there are some mitosis can six, six per high, uh, t 10 high power field. And, and you can see these are hyperchromatic. You can tell this is sarcoma. This is not benign tumor and it is hypercellular. There are some vascular spaces in between. Some of them, they have hemangiobercytoma like pattern. You can see this is what we call stag horn blood vessels with hemangiobercytoma. Uh, this is CD34. CD34, uh, we repeated this many times. Endothelial cells, we stain them with three uh, main uh, blood, uh, staining, CD34, CD31, and factor eight. Uh, I use only CD34 in this case. You can see the tumor cells are negative completely for CD34, but the blood vessels, the staghorn blood vessels are positive. So we know this is not a vascular origin tumor, although it is vascular, but this is a sarcoma of non-vascular tumor. Uh, this, this was a very important concept in this case. You can see epithelial membrane antigen, I, I saw a little bit of uh, uh, dot staining in some areas, uh, but it was most, most negative. We know that it is not meningioma because meningioma it was also in the differential because we are dealing in the vertebral body and you have to keep all your options open that this could be a strange case of meningioma. Meningioma, uh, always I indicated that usually it is uh, membranous and patchy, not in dot like pattern. Uh, progesterone, I did it because it's completely negative. We did it also because I like double positive and double negative. Uh, it's positive in meningioma, negative in other tumors, so it's negative, so it's not meningioma. So I feel comfortable. This is not a meningioma or meningosarcoma or something like that. Uh, with this S100, it was positive in multiple areas. So uh, positivity of S100 uh, indicate that it's a chondroid tumor. S100 also can be positive in neurogenic tumors. But in this context, with the morphology, it suggests suggest or with the uh, chondroid tumor. So I called it where uh, B53 was negative, uh, uh, and key 6 7 was about 6%. Uh, and uh, I called this uh, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma uh, by uh, according to the morphology. And, the, uh, and we noticed that most of the cases that uh, phosphaturonic acid or phosphaturonic tumors are usually mesenchymal chondrosarcomas. Uh, this is the paper that uh, some, um, I found that it was an exceptional case uh, and uh, 
they found a really histology. And almost it is very, very similar to my case with that we said. But they did the stain. This is the stain FG uh, fibrous growth factor 23, and it inside to hybridization was positive. And this is immune staining for fibrous growth factor one, and it was positive, nuclear staining. This is for, the, for confirmation of the tumor origin. Okay. Now, as the patient went out of hospital, again, we were uh, trying to find a final diagnosis. And uh, the family sent the, uh, the slides. It says we received four paraffin blocks labeled so and so. And the features are consistent with using camel contraceptive. Dr. Mahar, would you like to comment? The rest of the report. Other. This is the amended report. Features consistent with first factor of Just uh, for the correction. Uh, actually, I sent the patient for second opinion, the Dr. Hassan Anna. Uh, the second opinion was by Dr. Hassan Anna, and he gave a report completely different. It is mesenchymal. Uh, he, he will talk about it. He will talk yes, about it. Yes, but yes. he was a second person. And uh, you want him uh, to talk we first? Uh, for we can go say. To take a son a bit? Okay. Please. Okay. 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 So actually, I received uh, four therapy blocks in consultation. Uh, I usually write the history exactly yes, as yes, it yeah. comes to me. So I'm not sure what was the history, but there was nothing in the history to indicate that this patient had hypophosphatemia or uh, to any hint for the diagnosis. So actually, this is what I received. Uh, part of the tumor was spindly and cellular. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like these areas. And uh, some areas that were uh, fibrous, and they had these uh, blood vessels that had a staghorn-like appearance. Okay. Uh, another area which is very cellular and spindly. And then uh, here, this is the fibrous areas with the blood vessels. Next. Uh, this is uh, what is left of the bone, bone trabeculae, and this is the tumor infiltrating in between. Okay. Now, what caught my eyes is these small vacuoles, small spaces. They had these, these cells lining, and uh, they look like they are forming small blood vessels. So I thought that there is probably these are uh, you know, uh, endothelial cells. And with this cellularity, the same thing here. You can see them. I thought about hemangioendothelioma, actually. That's why I thought of it. So I put the differential. Now, one of the first was uh, hemangiomethelioma, zenchymal chondrosarcoma. I thought even about Ewing or primitive neuroctodermal monophasic synovial sarcoma comes into the differential. Phosphaturic mesenchymal, I never thought of it. I just, when I was told to present the case and the reports were sent to me, I thought about it. I've never seen a case. These are very rare. And usually they are mostly seen in soft tissues, but they can be in bone. So I did the stains. My mental was positive, and it means nothing. It is positive in almost every tumor. <laughs> I did. I sent fly one to King Hussein Cancer Center, and you can see this is a, a built-in control. Uh, these are the small blood vessels uh, that are endothelial cells are positively stained, but uh, some of the these are stained also, not very strongly, but they are stained. Uh, CD34 actually it was. This is a control from the appendix. And this is the patient it was negative, but I think this is false negative because also the normal endothelial cells are not staining. I don't know if this is related to technique, my technique, or I mean, I do it automated staining, but probably uh, the uh, decalcification that is done on this case, if any was done. Yeah, that was positive in my case. See, yeah, I don't know. But this is the control on the same slide. And I sent also CD31 to King Hussein Cancer Center. Some of these cells are positive, but the neoplastic cells inside, in between, are negative, actually. So I did also S100, it was negative. And this is CD99 for uh, Ewing or uh, synovial, it was negative also. And this is the last day, uh, KI67 proliferative index. 
to me, in my case, was very low. I mean, probably I said less than 5% in my report, but actually it is even much less than that, probably 1% or 2%. So I signed the case as consistent with the mangiometheliona, which is a vascular tumor of borderline malignancy. I'm actually, I'm not very... I think this is the last slide. Okay, so I received this case in consultation for a second opinion. And uh, it was already diagnosed uh, previously by my colleague Hussam as mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. That's the one. So when I looked at it initially, without knowing any history, and the history that was given with uh, this uh, case, I have uh, the report in hand, uh, lower limb weakness. That's the only history that was given. So if you're given this history and the patient has uh, a tumor that looks like mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, it was fine with me, so I called it mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. And the catch was when her children uh, or her sons, one of them was a dentist, came to me and said, doctor, you know, my uh, mother had osteogenic uh, oncogenic osteomalacia since 2012. Could that be related somehow to, this, uh, to, to her tumor? So I said, yeah, of course, let's review it. So I reviewed the case, and this is what we saw. So the importance of the history. So uh, first of all, when he told me that yeah, you know, the, the history is really six years long, all kinds of sarcomas are out of my differential. That's it. It's gone. <laughs> it doesn't belong there. OK? And then this is a very rare entity. This is my first case that I see. And Dr. Hassan, who is more senior to me a couple of years ago, <laughs> has never seen a case. And in the literature, there are only 300 cases reported so far. In the spine, only 18 out of those. And this would be the 19th. As, uh, anyway, so this, these are the pictures of, of the case. After you know, thinking of the entity, immediately, this is classical entity of vasputuric mesenchymal tumor. And it's not a sarcoma. Well, rarely it can be uh, behaved in a malignant fashion. And, uh, it's very vascular. You can see the, the vascular filled spaces in here, which is characteristic. And of course, the differential diagnosis, this is all blood, of course. The differential diagnosis is hemangiopericytoma or other uh, tumors that are very vascular. And of course, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is one of the differential because uh, a population of small cells and areas of cartilage that's calcified. This is the so-called Grange calcification that's coined in this. Uh, so initially, in the past, these in, the many tumors were actually classified into hemangiobricytoma or hemangiobricytoma, like different entities. Uh, however, somebody about like 10 years ago, or maybe more, uh, combined all of these and concluded, after really studying them in, uh, in a meta-analysis, that it's only one entity, although different histologies can be seen. So characterized by this blue cells, which are seen in mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, and this is the cartilage that's calcified with the Grange calcification. And sometimes, actually, you can see the small round blue cells that are seen in mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. That's why it's in the differential vascular spaces. And this is a high power view of this uh, Grange calcification. So the cells are actually bland, and I disagree with Hussam which I also you know, thought it was a sarcoma. I disagree that there were many mitotic figures. Actually, there were no mitotic figures. <laughs> but you did the KI-67, somebody did, which is a major. Yeah. Anyway, so it, it's not, there are no, actually, it's very bland. It's very bland, which means it usually behaves in a benign fashion. Next, please. So this is the area that looked like cartilage with the calcification. And actually, if you can go, OK. So we did one stain, we did many stains, but this is the only stain that's relevant. CD56, which is available in many labs. This is a neuroendocrine marker. CD56 is always positive. 
always positive. Vitamin 10, of course, can be positive in anything. So the S100 may be focal here. CD99, which is seen in mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, was negative, really. CD34, which is a marker of endothelial cells, is negative, as Hussein said, and uh, you, you've done some. So actually, there are no other markers in this case except for CD56. And uh, the, the thing, actually, there is, if you can go, if you can go to the, this, I just want to show the differential diagnosis histologically. In the same flash, please. Yeah. Same this. So, CD56 is a neural endocrine marker, and it was positive here, strongly positive, in the, which is the brown stain. Can you go to the case 2010? Yeah, another one. Yeah, this one. So, this is. This is a case, another spinal case, maybe one of those uh, 18 cases, because this has been reported previously. This is from a colleague of mine, a 61 year old, of the same, more or less same history. So the, the, most of these patients, I just want to show, okay, so you can see the small. So most of these patients, Allah, to, you, to your knowledge, the, these patients present with five year history. That's the average, as the doctor has shown. Five year history of Osteomalacia weakness actually, and nobody knows why. And that's the clue. So we have to do the PET scan or dotted uh, scan or what have you to try to find a very small, maybe one centimeter region. So it was, and the patient was lucky when she came to Jordan, she has a mass seen on the MRI. Otherwise, she went to Germany I and mean, they are not really, you know, idiots. <laughs> they have looked and did not find. So can we go to the differential? So it's a specific entity, phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor. Makes connective tissue, it's just a variant. It could be hemangiopericytoma like variant. Next, please. So we don't want to go through this, yeah. So here is the paper that was published that showed most osteomalacia associated mesenchymal tumors are a single histopathologic entity. Next, please. We don't have to, I mean, we have done all. Okay, so this is the microscopic fine. Again, similar uh, to what to our case, exactly. So you see the Grange calcifications and the blue cells like the ones uh, shown by Hussein. I just want to go to the differential because it's more or less the same. See the vascularity of these lesions, these are very vascular. And this is exactly like our case. So this is the differential diagnosis historically for pathologists. Imagiopericytoma, giant cell tumor, as one of the cases was called giant cell granuloma that Dr. Ibrahim showed. Osteoblastoma, osteosarcoma, zincimal chondrosarcoma, one of the differential. And hemangioma, which is uh, the other differential that Dr. Hassan thought of. So awareness of the entity. I, myself, and my colleagues would not have called it phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor, except for the history. So we always ask anybody who submits tissue for diagnosis, please give us history, for God's sake. If you give us the history, we'll give you the right diagnosis. But if uh, we were not aware, I mean, when her children told me she was sick for six years, I thought, okay, stop, this is not a sarcoma. I made a mistake. This has to be something else. So awareness of the entity, that's the most important, and the clinical history of osteomalacia or resistant hypophosphatine. Okay. Thank you. Question, man, you now, uh, from the hypophosphatemic osteomalacia, be it a phosphatemic, hypophosphatemic, or otherwise, you, there's several ways of looking at this. One of it is that it's a perineoplastic syndrome. And as you very well know, perineoplastic syndromes can Can, 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 can you come here, please? No, no, that's fine. No, 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 it's for the camera. I'll come to the podium. It's yourself. for the camera. I'm sorry, I'll come to the camera. So, um, but it's just a question. I haven't gotten to my... Uh, so, hypophosphatemic um, um, uh, phosphaturic uh, uh, osteomalacia or otherwise yeah. is, a, is a form or can be looked at as a form of perineoplastic syndromes. And as you very well know, but it's a reminder for everybody in the audience, perineoplastic syndromes can precede the malignancy yes, yes. by years. Yeah. So it is semantics, but it, they, they have really implications. So if a perineoplastic syndrome can precede the, the, the malignancy by years, one can advocate that this patient had a perineoplastic uh, 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 hypophosphatemic osteomalacia for okay. years until the diagnosis of the cancer was obvious, which would bring back to one of your slides that one? you succinctly uh, 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 showed. Most of the cases would fall into one unified pathological entity, not, not all of them. 
And the, the tumors that can cause hypophosphatemic or stimulation are numerous. They're no, not necessarily mesenchymal. Yeah, no. Are well, numerous. No, no. They're not necessarily mesenchymal. Plasma cell disorders can cause that. Uh, a lot of sarcomas can cause that. Uh, Condosarcoma can uh, cause that. Fever. Somebody did Correct. that work and no. And in your and the paper that you've showed, most of the cases would fall in the mixed connective tissue uh, 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 waste basket. No, that no, we it's don't not a waste know. basket. We don't know. Ala, this is an entity Ismani that Ismani. you have not seen before. Ismani. I tell you, Ala, this is phosphatoria. This is an M. Phosphatoria is a human tumor. We're. Hala. The question, I have, you haven't answered the question? Yes, yet. what's the question? So the question, how can you differentiate between paraneoplastic, hypophosphatemic osteomyosin, paraneoplastic osteomyosin, and this entity? So, in other words, you cannot rule out the diagnosis of... I know, I know, exactly. Let me answer. First of all, you said cancer. This is not a cancer. 95% of these are benign, benign tumors. 95%? Okay. 95% are... Which would leave you Some with 5% that are malignant. This is so a my very specific are the 5 entity. This is this a is very malignant. specific entity. If we look... Uh, let, let, me, let me just explain one thing. This is a very specific entity produced by one specific tumor, only one. Most of them. Only one. All... If you're saying about myeloma producing hypophosphatemia, that's a different altogether because yeah, we're, we're, looking, about we're talking about a tumor induced osteomalacia that is secondary to FGF 23 high levels in the serum. So in myeloma, there will not be an FGF23, and they will not be resistant to vitamin D or phosphate. Yeah. So we're talking about a phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor as being a specific entity. I'm not talking about myeloma. Not, not, not benign. We're talking about so perineal No, no. The 95% are benign, Hussam, and the cure by oxygen if they are in the soft tissues. 5% are malignant and they might metastasize. In difficult locations to excise, like in the spine, those benign lesions can recur. So, so paraneoplastic disorders, generally, regardless of the etiology, I'm not talking about the step, I'm not talking about the um, uh, the 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 osteomalacia associated with multiple myeloma. I'm talking about hypophosphatemic osteomalacia, the paraneoplastic syndrome that can be seen with other entities, being a few plasma cell disorders, metastatic disorders, and other sarcomas like chromosome. Uh, all mesenchymal condosome. So you, you actually did say in the 95% of cases would be unified in that, which means that 5% of cases would not. So the 5% of cases would include things like mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, would include other sarcomas, and would include other tumors as well. So back to the question that I have asked, that I haven't heard the answer for yet, is how would you differentiate a paraneoplastic Hypophosphatemic, uh, phosphaturic, um, uh, osteomalacia, paraneoplastic, in association with another malignancy like chondrosarcoma or the like, from this entity. Okay, well, so is, is my question clear? Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 of course. I'll, let me just explain. This is a specific syndrome, okay? If all the constellation of this syndrome are found, it's not secondary to any other neoplasm except for PMT, phosphatoric yes. mesenchymal tumor. That's one. Second, as Dr. Hassan here nicely answered, uh, the morphology. Other sarcomas are sarcomas. Now, once I am aware of this entity by history, and a, click, a, a tip was given to me, I immediately thought of that and recognized it. It has very specific morphology. Other sarcomas are have other specific morphologies and but other markers and there other there markers. Are, there are features morphologically. Yes, yes, of course. Of yes, yes, there are. Of course. Back to my question. Since there's How would you differentiate? Entity, mm -hmm. Since there's a new entity mm -hmm. with 300 cases reported in the literature, mm -hmm. okay, how would you differentiate this new entity from a well 
an older, well-established entity lying yes, uh, by morphology. Having but this uh, as uh, a paraneoplastic manifestation of it that preceded the cancer for... You mean how to differentiate before the biopsy is there? <coughs> the biopsy the is already there. We cannot, we cannot call By this morphology? for sure post uh, 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 tumor without doing Can, can we just have a, a listen to what Dr. Kamajumar uh, I was in charge for the patient, actually, from medical point of view, before surgery and after surgery. I followed the patient till now. Uh, really, I was against the first impression of chondrosarcoma simply because I did my search. I did Google it, put chondrosarcoma FGF23 on Google Scholar, you will not find anything. If you will not find FGF, you put now, you put on Google Scholar, chondrosarcoma FGF23, you will not find anything. <coughs> this is the first. Second, <coughs> I will do not have Your point is Sorry. very well taken. Yeah, you show Sorry. Uh, Allah, I just want to review the yes. literature about the histopathology. I, the, the major, the large uh, series. This is the histopathology. Answer. I want to review just a minute. The patient the sent FGF23 to France according to her children and the level was high. No, no, no. Okay, uh, just a minute, please. This is the histopathology which is reported in 144 cases from Japan. The tumors, uh, the tumors associated with TO are usually small and mesenchymal in origin. The prototypical phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor, mixed connective tissue variant, contain neoplastic cells that are expanded in the tostelet in shape normochromatic with a small nuclei and distinct nuclei. The nuclear grade is low and mitotic activity is usually absent or very low. The cells are typically embedded within a mixoid or mixochondroid matrix with a grangy calcification that can resemble chondroid or osteoid. Numerous osteoclasts like giant cells are frequent finding and mature fat and even lamellar bone may also be seen. A prominent feature of these tumors are, is an elaborate interesting microvascular with an admixture of visible cells and vascular fat. This is the classical, this is another, there is another classification. Please know that this is the prototypical type. Please know that you are referring to the prototypical, the prototypical type, which means by definition. I'll continue. Just, just a minute. Uh, Winter in uh, 1991 was the first to propose cl classification system based on the histological finding of 16 just cases of tumor-induced osteomalacia and designated the tumors as phosphatiuric mesenchymal tumor. Theo tumors can be further subdivided into four categories. Mixed connective tissue variant, osteoblastoma-like variant, non-ossifying fi fibroma-like variant, ossifying fibroma-like variant. The mixed allele first variant, usually it uh, constitutes more than 80% of the cases. This is the most definite here with staining with FGF23. Unfortunately, it is not available. Thank you. So the, six years history. And just a message to the young uh, doctors in the room. Uh, it has been mentioned that specimens and samples are sent without history. This is a basic fact in the third world countries. MRI is fine without any histology or sample from the histology without any, without any details. This is very important. You just don't ask for a second opinion without giving details. So. Good evening, everybody. After all, this is a, the first opinion. opinion. <laughs> the first opinion. <laughs> Okay, after all the details, I'm not going to go into any other uh, uh, specifications about the tumor, the very rare entity, Dr. Ala. Yes, and uh, uh, I was asked by Dr. Muhammad to do uh, further imaging for the patient. 
And the first question was, why not to do FDG PET scan? We are all used to this uh, modality for imaging tumors. The answer was that uh, it is very sensitive, yet not specific in this tumor. And it is associated with many uh, uh, sites of uptake, especially in our patient, because she had uh, many possible fractures and cracks all over her very fragile bones. And the search was done about uh, gallium-68 PET-CT scan, which is a somatostatin receptor. Uh, uh, which, and we know that this tumor is very rich in somatostatin receptors. Uh, we combine here the, the uh, directed um, anatomical, I mean imaging, with the radionuclide imaging and the functional image in one uh, combined and fused image, which uh, makes it more uh, accurate. Um, we all know the, that the old uh, um, imaging modality was the NDM, which is not really used anymore because it is at, at least 10 times less uh, sensitive than the gallium tracers, which are used on the PET CT scan. And the images are of less resolution, especially when they are not fused with anatomical CT images. I'll be very quick. This is our patient when she first came. This is the normal distribution. Oh, sorry. What is the cursor? Uh, one pointer. Okay, uh, this is the first presentation. It was really challenging to image this patient because of uh, the very bad, severe kyphosis and uh, the curves in her spine. Um, and this is. Sorry. Oops. Okay, this is exactly the lesion in the mid thoracic spine. And as you can see, uh, anatomical details are very poor in our scan because of the, the deformity the patient had. This was shown by Dr. Brahim uh, on the MRI scan. And this uh, uh, clearly defines that this tumor is very rich in somatostatin receptor. And this is what we use in this radionuclide. That's a nice picture. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And this is the MIP image. This is a three-dimensional. Uh, it's the same. Hi, this is the only the radionuclide image of the patient, the PET scan. And this is the PET CT scan fused together in axial images. Yeah, this, these are the normal sites that I said. The normal sites of distribution of this radius tracer is, is the sites of somatostatin receptors in the body, which is usually the, uh, uh, the pituitary gland the, this is a, a sagittal view, so it's not very clear. And this is the uh, spleen and the liver. You will see some distribution within the uh, intestines. And there is a very high uptake within the uh, uh, kidneys and excretion of tracer into the urinary bladder. So this is all part of the normal distribution. This is the only, this is the only abnormal uh, distribution here. This small focal lesion. Yeah, it's in the mid thoracic spine, T4, T5. Uh, so improving the diagnosis, we did many research on many papers. I will not go through them again, but uh, it is very useful in detecting osteomalacia, uh, tumor-induced osteomalacia. And uh, there was many studies, okay, we're very late, so I'll just go into some images from the literature, which are similar to the one we got. This is one lesion in the ischial bone, as you can see here, totally surgically removed in the next uh, scan. This is another small, very small focal lesion in the intertrochanteric area inducing uh, oncogenic osteomalacia. And this is a soft tissue lesion in the heel. Okay? Now, um, as Dr. Brahim told you, the excision was not complete. Uh, it was only debulking to relieve the spine. So Dr. Muhammad sent the patient again after almost a month or two of surgery uh, to see what happened. And this is the initial scan on the bottom here. This is the lesion. And this is the scan after surgery. And we can clearly see it's definitely less bulk, evident by the patient who was coming uh, this time almost walking with a walker. Uh, the first time she was on the bed, on the striker. But the function is still there. There are still somatostatin receptors in a positive lesion somewhere. So, we came to the uh, uh, end of the, uh, or it's not the end, maybe it's uh, part of what uh, came up to Dr. Muhammad's mind and we discussed it thoroughly about thanostics in nuclear medicine where we use the radionuclide targeted to the lesion to deliver a beta radiation and kill the, the cells 
in, in place without affecting other sites of the body. And this is a very important uh, uh, new uh, uh, branch in nuclear medicine that is advancing now. So this is what we do. We image the patient, and this is what we did with the gallium-68 PET CT scan. And then we use the same radionuclide and label it to a beta emitter to introduce the radiation directly to the tumor. And then we monitor. We should see very good response in most tumors. If it's normal, we just stop. If there is still residual, we can repeat the therapy again. And this applies to the very old uh, therapy that we all know, which is iodine used in thyroid cancer. It's almost the same, but this time by binding it to a, a, a particle that directly goes to the somatostatin receptors. And um, this was a study published in 2016 uh, implementing that lutetium dotatate. Uh, uh, radionuclide therapy was had promising results in, in treating these uh, phosphatidylureic mesenchymal tumors, and um, there were almost uh, three or four studies, but with very limited number of patients because, as we know, the the entity is very rare. Uh, we used lutetium one seventy seven, which is a beta emitter, and at the same time, it has a gamma emission which allows uh, imaging after uh, therapy. Um, we explained fully to the patient and her uh, family uh, the kind of treatment. We really um, stressed the point that it is not um, written in any guidelines, actually. Uh, it was just thinking out of uh, the box, as they say. And um, it was our only way now to give her a directed therapy without causing any side effects or any major side effects. And they agreed on the therapy. Uh, uh, lutetium uh, beta particles will penetrate only within a maximum of 1.7 millimeters, so it is very uh, uh, localized treatment. And the gamma energy will allow post-therapy imaging. There are absolute and relative indications, which I will not go through because we're really late, but um, the most important uh, are two things, uh, radiation to the bone marrow, so the patient should have a very good uh, blood counts and she was uh, normal from that point. And the other thing is uh, uh, preparing the patient to protect the kidneys because the radionuclide will be excreted through the proximal tubules and binds there. So uh, it will deliver high radiation to the uh, kidneys, both kidneys. What we do is we infuse um, amino acids that will competitively bind there and protect the kidneys from the uh, radio tracer and the beta radiation. And this is done um, in many ways, what one of the protocols that I used is giving the, the infusion uh, an hour before introducing the radioactive material and continuing for four hours thereafter. Uh, the patient should be, um, you give, you can repeat the cycles actually and, uh, and every six to 12 weeks and you can give up to five cycles. This therapy is very well established in uh, treating um, neuroendocrine tumors, metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, but again, not this entity. Um, the side effects are very minimal. During infusion, the patient might be nauseated, and this is usually because of some electrolyte imbalance induced by uh, acidosis, and she might develop hyperkalemia. That was all uh, monitored all through the therapy. And uh, she was pre-treated with um, uh, anti-emitters and uh, hydrocortisone, very well hydrated all through uh, her stay in the hospital. And um, we should always monitor by a complete uh, uh, blood count and renal function uh, thereafter every eight to 12 weeks and to evaluate the response of treatment after at least three months uh, with another uh, PET CT scan. This is a very interesting scan. It's a planar image, uh, anterior posterior, just like we do the bone scans on a regular gamma camera, not a PET CT scan. And this is the site of the radionuclide uh, concentration, the lutetium 177 dotatate, which is the same site of the uh, residual of the tumor used. So the and between this and its scan, different. The, the first PET scan was done before surgery. The no, second, the same material, the same material you no, use. no. This is the the therapeutic uh, lutetium therapy. It's, 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 it was labeled with dotatate. Okay, the one we used for imaging on a PET CT is labeled with gallium sixty eight, which is a, a positron emitter. 
okay? It's a PET CT scan with, not with the usual FDG that we use for all other tumors. This is specific for somatostatin receptors. It's exactly like octreotide. So this is for therapeutic purposes? This is for therapeutic, but we used the, the gamma emission from the radionuclide to do the images, okay? And this was almost uh, 36 hours. Uh, usually it's done 24, 48, or 72 hours after the therapy. This was 36 hours after. And uh, we're, very, um, we're very happy for the result, and we're waiting to see the, the follow-up uh, PET CT scan. The patient was doing excellent. She came walking uh, to the therapy. She went out walking. Um, she had good surgery. She had good surgery. <laughs> <laughs> surgery yes, of you course. Think, right? okay, <laughs> yes. Just to comment about the treatment. Uh, she, before surgery, the patient was initially on high dose phosphorus. The dose reached six gram daily, yani around 12 tablets for space sandals, yani divided in six. Uh, times a day, and she received one alpha, seven microgram daily initially, and four, uh, two gram calcium elemental daily to maintain her calcium level and phosphorus within the normal range. But now, when she left a few days ago, she left Jordan, she was on just one alpha, three microgram daily, and just two tablets for space sandals it means one gram phosphorus only without any calcium preparation and their calcium level, phosphorus, PTH, vitamin D, all of them, they were normal. And uh, I hope she will come within the next three uh, months to see the results of uh, lutetium uh, ablation of the residual tumor. Thank you. We have to close the discussion. Yes, yes. <coughs> yes. uh, we have to close the discussion. We can never reach to a definite conclusions here. This is an eye opener for all of us to listen to each other, to discuss with each other. There is no one who knows everything. The one who knows everything does not exist. We have to trust each other. We have to exchange ideas. And this meeting is a symbol of this. We are meeting here for this purpose to exchange ideas, to respect each other's opinion, how, whatever our differences with. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we use this mobility for other tumors? Yes, uh, it, is, it is documented for mm -hmm. neuroendocrine mm -hmm. tumors. Mm -hmm. And, we have Which are, and, and now the, the very, the booming yeah. thing is therapy for prostate cancer, yes. uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer. Okay. It's a localized tumor. So did we ever consider externally radiotherapy, or was it contraindicated? It's not to me to decide. <laughs> there is other it's mobility of treatment things. for such tumor. Uh, there is uh, reported cases of radio frequency ablation, cryoablation, but the experience is limited. But in this case, I think it is dangerous. And the location is dangerous. Another issue, you can ask why to treat at all uh, if the location of the tumor was not in the spine. I just Sometimes I just go for medical treatment, just give her phosphorus and one hand and she will be fine. But the localization of the tumor, it can recur again and expand again and do compression on the spinal cord and she will come again. With Thank, you very much. Thank you very much. Did you have to close the discussion? We'll meet next week, but tonight we have to leave. There's tonight a big match, the classic tour between Real Madrid and Barcelona. Yeah. And I feel sorry for the Real Madrid. <laughs> شكرا لك